Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me this time. Last time I think that it was like five minutes in before anyone can hear me. How are you guys doing? Happy Monday. Let me know in the chat if you guys can hear me. Hold on, let me turn on my own chat and see um, <laughs> if you guys can hear me or not. Hey, hi Megan Randall. Hi Club de Medicado VIP. I don't know if I'm saying your name wrong or not. And Steph is here modding. Um, I don't think Tiff can make it because she's really tired today. And hi, Dragonfly. You guys are all ready to go. Okay. And there's my Meza. Uh, oh, look. I don't think Tiff can make it because she's really tired. <laughs> That's an amateur move. <laughs> Not allowed to do that. Okay. So, um, yeah. Hi, Darcy. Good to see all of you guys. So where we left off was on chapter 11. And what's happened is we just found out that Duncan, the editor, is dead from the culling song. And so um, we, I'm gonna try to make this full screen. So let's see if that works. Can you guys still hear me? Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna, try to so you don't have to see my face and um what does that say on top oh it's for lightroom oh gosh lightroom giving me notifications okay so we found out duncan was dead from the culling song so now we get to see what's going on with he with helen hoover boyle and where she's going to take us and we haven't met Oyster yet, Mona's boyfriend. So let's see how far we can get today. Grab your favorite comfy clothes, get into your favorite position, and um, let's make this journey together. Hopefully I'm coming in clear. Yeah, Duncan is um, Strenner's um, boss. He's the editor at the i believe the whatever section he's in like he's the editor of that section i forgot already and now he's answering to somebody else henderson i believe who he almost did the calling song for that he promised he would never ever do so let's get into this these noiseaholics these quiet aphobics. There's the stomp, stomp, stomp of a drum coming down through the ceiling, through the walls. You hear the laughter and applause of dead people. Even in the bathroom, even taking a shower, you can hear talk radio over the hiss of the shower head, the splash of water in the tub and blasting against the plastic curtain. It's not that you want everybody dead, but it would be nice to unleash the culling spell on the world, just to enjoy the fear. After people outlawed loud sounds, any sounds that could harbor a spell, any music or noise that might mask a deadly poem, after that the world would be silent, dangerous and frightened, but silent. The tile beats a tiny rhythm under my fingertips. The bathtub vibrates with shouts coming through the floor. Either a prehistoric flying dinosaur awakened by a nuclear test is about to destroy the people downstairs or their television's too loud. In a world where vows are worthless, where making a pledge means nothing, where promises are made to be broken, it would be nice to see words come back into power. In a world where the culling song was common knowledge, there would be sound blackouts. Like during wartime, wardens would patrol. 
But instead of hunting for light, they'd listen for noise and tell people to shut up. The way governments look for air and water pollution, these same governments would pinpoint anything above a whisper, then make an arrest. There would be helicopters, special muffled helicopters, of course, to search for noise the way they search for marijuana now. People would tiptoe around in rubber-soiled shoes. Informers would listen at every keyhole. It would be dangerous, frightened. It would be a dangerous, frightened world, but at least you could sleep with your windows open. It would be a world where each word was worth a thousand pictures. It's hard to say if that world would be any worse than this. The pounding music, the roar of television, the squawk of radio. Maybe without Big Brother filling us, people could think. The upside is maybe our minds would become our own. It's harmless to say, it's harmless so I say the first line of the Cullen poem. There's no one here to kill. No way anyone could hear it. And Helen Hoover Boyle is right. I haven't forgot it. The first word generates the second. The line, the first line generates the next. My voice booms as big as an opera. The words thunder with the deep rolling sound of a bowling alley. The thunder echoes against the tile and linoleum. In my big opera voice, the calling song doesn't sound silly the way it did in Duncan's office. It sounds heavy and rich. It's the sound of doom. It's the doom of my upstairs neighbor. It's the end to his life. And I've said the whole poem. Even wet, the hairs bristling on the back of my neck. My breathing stopped. And nothing. From upstairs, there's the stomp of music. From every direction, there's radio and television talk, tiny gunshots, laughter, bombs, sirens, a dog barks. This is what passes for prime time. I turn off the water. I shake my hair. I pull back the shower curtain and reach for a towel. And then I see it. The vent. The air shaft. It connects every apartment. The vent, it's always open. It carries steam from the bathrooms, cooking smells from the kitchens. It carries every sound. Dripping on the bathroom floor, I just stare at the vent. It could be I've just killed the whole building. Chapter 12. Nash is at the bar on third, eating onion dip with his fingers. He sticks two shiny fingers into his mouth, sucking so hard his cheeks cave in. He pulls the fingers out and pinches some more onion dip out of a plastic tub. I ask if that's breakfast. You got a question, he says. You need to show me the money first. And he puts his fingers in his mouth. On the other side of Nash, down the bar, some young guy with sideburns wearing a good pinstripe suit. Next to him is a gal sitting on the bar rail so she can kiss him. He tosses the cherry from his cocktail into his mouth. They kiss. Then she's chewing. The radio behind the bar is still announcing the school lunch menus. Nash keeps turning his head to watch them. This is what passes for love. I put a $10 bill on the bar. His fingers still in his mouth. His eyes look down at it. Then his eyebrows come up. I ask, did anyone die in my building last night? It's the apartments at 17th and Loomis Place. The Loomis Place apartments. Eight stories, a kind of kidney colored brick. Maybe somebody on the fifth floor, near the back. A young guy. This morning, there's a weird stain on my ceiling. 
the side burns guy, his cell phone starts ringing. And Nash pulls his fingers out, his lips dragged out around them in a tight pucker. Nash looks at his fingernails close up, cross-eyed. The dead guy was into drugs, I tell him. A lot of people in that building are into drugs. I ask if there were any other dead people in there. By any chance a whole bunch of people die in the Loomis Place apartments last night? And the sideburns guy grabs the gal by a handful of hair and pulls her away from his mouth. With his other hand, he takes the phone from inside his coat and flips it open, saying, Hello? I'd say they'd all be found with no apparent cause of death. Nash stirs a finger around in the onion dip and says, That your building? Yeah, I already said that. Still holding the gal by her hair, talking into the phone, the sideburns guy says, No, honey, he says, I'm at the doctor's office right now, and it doesn't look very good. The gal closes her eyes. She arches her neck back and grinds her hair into his hands. And the sideburns guy says, No, it looks like it's mes metastasized, he says. No, I'm okay. The gal opens her eyes. He winks at her. She smiles. And the sideburns guy says, that means a lot right now. I love you too. He hangs up and pulls the gal's face into his. And Nash takes the 10 off the bar and stuffs it into his pocket. He says, nope, didn't hear a thing. The gal, her feet slip off the bar rail and she laughs. She steps back up and says, was that her? And the sideburn guy says, no. And without me trying, it happens. Me just looking at the sideburns guy, the song flits into my head. The song, my voice in the shower, the voice of doom, it echoes inside me as fast as a reflex, as fast as a sneeze, it happens. Nash, his breath is nothing but onions, he says. It sounds kind of funny you asking that. He puts his stirring finger into his mouth. And the gal down the bar says, Marty? And the sideburns guy leaning against the bar slides to the floor. Nash turns to look. The gal's kneeling next to the guy on the floor, her hands spread open just above, but not quite touching his pinstripe lapels. And she says, Marty? Her fingernails are painted sparkling purple. Her purple lipstick is smeared all around the guy's mouth. And maybe the guy's really sick. Maybe he's choked on a cherry. Maybe I didn't just make another kill. The gal looks up at Nash and me, her face glossy with tears and says, does one of you know CPR? Nash puts his fingers back into the onion dip and I step over the body past the gal pulling on my coat, headed for the door. Chapter 13. Back in the newsroom, Wilson from the international desk wants to know if I've seen Henderson today. Baker from the books desk says Henderson didn't call in sick and he doesn't answer his phone at home. Oliphant from the special features desk says, Strediter, you see this? He hands me a tear sheet, an ad that says, attention Patreons of the French Salon. It says, have you experienced severe bleeding and scarring as a result of recent facials? The number, the phone number is one I haven't seen before. And when I dial a woman says, Dugan, Diller and Dunn, attorneys at law, she says. and I hang up. Oliphant stands by my desk and says, while you're here, say something nice about Duncan. They're putting together a feature, he says, a tribute to Duncan, a nice portrait and a summary of his career, and they need people to think up good quotes. Somebody in art is using the photo from Duncan's employee badge to paint the portrait. Only smiling, Oliphant says, smiling and more like a human being. Before that, 
walking from the bar on third back to work, I counted my steps. To keep my mind busy, I counted 276 steps until a guy wearing a black leather trench coat shoves past me at a street corner saying, wake up, asshole, the sign says walk. Hitting me as sudden as a yawn, me glaring at the guy's black leather back, the calling song loops through my head. Still crossing the street, the guy in the trench coat lifts his foot to step over the far curb, but doesn't clear it. His toe kicks into the curb halfway up, and he pitches forward onto the sidewalk, flat on his forehead. It's the sound of dropping an egg on the kitchen floor, only a really big, big egg full of blood and brains. His arms lie straight down at his sides. The toes of his black wingtips hang off the curb a little, over the gutter. I step past him, counting 277, counting 278, counting 279. A block from the newspaper, a sawhorse barricade blocks the sidewalk. A police officer in a blue uniform stands on the other side, shaking his head. You have to go back and cross the street. This sidewalk's closed, he says. They're shooting a movie up the block. Hitting me as fast as a cramp. Me scrawling at his badge. The eight lines of the song run through my mind. The officer's eyes roll up until only the white show. One gloved hand gets halfway to his chest and his knees fold. His chin comes down on the top edge of the barricade so hard you can hear his teeth click together. Something pink flies out. It's the tip of his tongue. Counting 345, counting 346, counting. 347. I haul one leg, then the other, over the barricade and keep walking. A woman with a walkie-talkie in one hand steps into my path, one arm straight out in front of her, her hand reaching to stop me. The moment before her hand should grab my arm, my eyes roll over and her lips, her eyes roll over and her lips drop open. A thread of drool slips out one corner of her slack mouth and she falls through my path, her walkie-talkie saying, Jeannie, Jean, stand by. The last words of the culling song trail through my head, counting 359, counting 360, counting 361. I keep walking as people rush past me in the other direction. A woman with a light meter hanging on a cord around her neck says, did somebody call an ambulance? People dressed in rags, wearing thick makeup and drinking water out of little blue glass bottles. They stand in front of shopping carts piled with trash under big lights and reflectors, stretching their necks to see where I've been. The curb is lined with big trailers and motorhomes with the smell of diesel generators running in between them. Paper cups half full of coffee are sitting everywhere. Counting 378, counting 379, counting 380. I step over the barricade on the far side and keep walking. It takes 412 steps to get to the newsroom. In the elevator on the way up, there are already too many people crowded in. On the fifth floor, another man tries to shoulder his way into the car. Sudden is breaking a sweat, me squeezed against the back of the elevator. My mind spits out the culling song so hard my lips move with each word. Hold on, sorry. Hold on, sorry. The man looks at us all and seems to step back in slow motion. Before we see him hit the floor, the doors are closed and we're going up. In the newsroom, Henderson is missing. Oliphant comes over while I'm still dialing my phone. He tells me about the tribute to Duncan. Ask for quotes. He shows me the ad on the tear sheet. 
the ad about the French salon, the bleeding facials. Oliphant asks me where my next ins installment is on the Crip Death series. The phone in my hand, I'm counting 435, counting 436, counting 437. To him, I say to just not piss me off. A woman's voice on the phone says, Helen Boyle Realty, may I help you? And Oliphant says, have you tried counting to 10? The details about Oliphant are he's fat and his hands sweated brown handprints on the tear sheet he shows me. His computer password is password. And I say, I passed 10 a long time ago. And the voice on the phone says, hello? With my hand over the phone, I tell Oliphant, there must be a virus going around. That's probably why Henderson's gone. I'm going home, but I promise to file my story from there. Oliphant mounts, mouths the word, four o'clock deadline, and he taps the face of his wristwatch. And into the phone, I ask, is Helen Hoover Boyle in the office? I say my, na my name's Strenner, Strenator, and I need to see her right away. I'm counting 489, counting 490, counting 491. The voice says, will she know what this is regarding? Yeah, I say, but she'll pretend she doesn't. And Oliphant backs away a couple of steps before he breaks eye contact and heads towards special features. I'm counting 542, counting 543. On my way to the real estate office, I ask the cab to wait in front of, the, of my apartment building while I run upstairs. The brown stain on my ceiling is bigger. It's maybe as big round as a tire, only now the stain has arms and legs. Back in the cab, I try to buckle my seatbelt, but it's adjusted too small and it cuts into me, my gut riding on top of it. And I hear Helen Hoover Boyle saying, middle-aged, 5'10", maybe 170 pounds, Caucasian, brown, green. I see her under her bubble of pink hair winking at me. I tell the driver the address for the real estate office and I tell him that he can drive as fast as he wants, but just not to piss me off. The details about the cab are it stinks. The seat is black and sticky. It's a cab. I say, I have a little problem with anger. The driver looks at me in his rear view mirror and says, you should maybe get some anger management classes. And I'm counting 578, counting 579, counting 580. Chapter 14. According to the Architectural Digest, big mansions surrounded by vast estate gardens and thoroughbred horse farms are really good places to live. According to Town and Country, strands of fat pearls are lustrous. According to Travel and Leisure, a private yacht anchored in the sunny Mediterranean is relaxing. In the waiting room of the, of the Helen Boyle real estate agency, what, this is what passes as, big news flash, as a big news flash, a real scoop. On the coffee table, there's copies of all these high-end magazines. There's a humpback Chesterfield couch upholstered in striped pink silk. The sofa table behind it has long lion legs, their claws gripping glass balls. You have to wonder how much of this furniture came here stripped of its hardware, its drawer pulls and metal details. Sold as junk, it came here and Helen Hoover Boyle put it back together. The young woman half my age sits behind a car of Louis XIV's desk, staring at a clock radio on the desk. Her desk plate says, Mona Sabat, and next to the clock radio is a police scanner crackling with static. 
on the clock radio, an older woman is yelling at a younger woman. It seems a younger woman has gotten pregnant out of wedlock, so the older woman is calling her a slut and a whore. A stupid whore, the older woman says, since the slut spread her legs without even getting paid. The woman at the desk, this Mona person, turns off the police scanner and says, I hope you don't mind, I love this show. The media holics, these quiet aphobics. On the clock radio, the older woman tells the slut to give her baby up for adoption unless she wants to ruin its future. She tells the slut to grow up and finish her degree in microbiology, then get married, but not have any more sex until then. Mona Savat takes a brown paper bag from under the desk and takes out something wrapped in foil. She picks the foil open at one end and you can smell garlic and marigolds. On the clock radio, the pregnant slut just cries and cries. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can hurt like hell. According to an article in Town and Country, Beautifully handwritten personal correspondence on luxurious stationery is once again very in, in, in. In a copy of a state magazine, there's an advertisement that says, Attention, Patreons of the Bridal Mountain Riding and Polo Club. It says, Have you contracted a parasitic skin infection from a mount? The phone number is one I haven't seen before. The radio woman tells the slut to stop crying. Here's Big Brother singing and dancing, force feeding you so your mind never gets hungry enough to think. Mona Savat puts both elbows on her desk and cradles her lunch in her hands, leaning close to the radio. The phone rings and she answers it saying, Helen Boyle Realty, the right home every time, she says. Sorry, Oyster, Dr. Sarah's on, she says. I'll see you at the ritual. The radio woman calls the crying slut a bitch. The cover of First Class Magazine says, Sable, the justifiable homicide. And fast as a hiccup, me only half listening on the radio, me half reading, the culling song goes through my head. From the clock radio, all you can hear is a slut sobbing and sobbing. Instead of the older woman, there's silence. Sweet, golden silence. Too perfect to let anyone left alive. The slut draws a long breath and asks, Dr. Sarah, she says, Dr. Sarah, are you still there? And a deep voice comes on saying, the Dr. Sarah Lowenstein show was temporarily experiencing some technical difficulties. The deep voice apologizes. A moment later, dance music starts up. The cover of Maynard Born magazine says, diamonds go casual. I put my face in my hands and groan. The Mona person peels the foil back from her lunch and takes another bite. She turns off the radio and says, bummer. On the backs of her hands, rusty brown henna designs trail down her fingers, her fingers and thumbs lumpy with silver rings. A lot of silver chains loop around her neck and disappear into her orange dress. On her chest, the crinkled orange fabric of her dress is bumpy from all the pendants hanging underneath. Her hair is a thousand coils and dreadlocks of red and black pinned up over silver filigree earrings. Her eyes look amber, her fingernails black. I ask if she's worked here long. You mean, she says, in earth time? And she takes the paper back from a drawer in her desk. She uncaps a bright yellow highlighter and opens the book. I ask if Mrs. Boyle ever talks about poetry and Mona says, you mean Helen? Yeah, does she ever recite poetry? 
In her office, does she ever call people on the phone and read any poems to them? Don't get me wrong, Mona says, but Mrs. Boyle's way too much into the money side of everything, you know? I have to start counting. One, counting. Two, it's like this, she says. When traffic's bad, Mrs. Boyle makes me drive home with her just so she's able to use the carpool lane. Then I have to take three buses to get home myself. You know, I'm counting four, counting five, she says. One time we had this great sharing about the power of crystal. It's like we're finally connecting on some level. Only it turns out we were talking about two totally different realities. Then I'm on my feet unfolding a sheet of paper from my back pocket. I show her the poem and ask if it looks familiar. Highlighted in the book on her desk, it says, magic is the tuning of needed energy for natural change. Her amber eyes move back and forth in front of the poem, just above the orange neckline of her dress, above her right collarbone. She has a tattooed three tiny black stars. She's sitting cross-legged in her swivel chair. Her feet are bare and dirty with silver rings around each big toe. I know what this is, she says, and her hand comes up. Before her fingers close around it, I fold the paper and tuck it back into my back pocket. Her hand still in the air, she points an index finger at me and says, I've heard of those. It's a culling spell, right? Highlighted in the book on her desk, it says, the ultimate product of death is evoking rebirth. Across the polished cherry top of the desk is a long, deep gouge. I ask, what can she tell me about culling spells? All the literature mentions them, she says and shrugs, but they're supposed to be lost. She holds her hand out, palm up and says, let me see again. And I say, how do they work? And she wiggles her fingers. And I shake my head, no. I ask, how come it kills other people, but not the person who says it? And tilting her head to one side a little, Mona says, why doesn't a gun kill the person who pulls the trigger? It's the same principle. She lifts both arms above her head and stretches, twisting her hands toward the ceiling. She says, this doesn't work like a recipe in a cookbook. You can't dissect this with some electric microscope. You can't dissect this with some electron microscope. Her dress is sleeveless and her hair under her arms is just regular mousy brown. So I say, how can it work on somebody who doesn't even hear the spell? I look at the radio. How can a spell work if you don't even say it out loud? Mona Sabat sighs. She turns her open book face down on the desk and sticks the yellow highlighter behind one ear. She pulls open a desk drawer and takes out a pad and pencil saying, you don't have a clue, do you? Writing on the pad, she says, when I was Catholic, this is years ago, I could say a seven second Hail Mary. I could say a nine second Our Father. When you get as much, as much penance as I did, you get fast, she says. When you get that fast, it's not even words anymore, but it's still a prayer, she says. All a spell does is focus and intention. She says this slow, word by word, and waits a beat. Her eyes on mine, she says, if the practitioner's intention is strong enough, the object of the spell will fall asleep, no matter where. The more emotion a person has bottled up, she says, the more powerful the spell. Mona Sabat squints at me and says, when was the last time you got laid? Almost two decades ago, but I don't tell her that. 
my guess, she says, is you're a powder keg of something. Rage, sorrow, something. She stops writing and flips through a highlighted book, stopping at a page. She reads for a moment, then flips to another page. A well-balanced person, she says, a functioning person would have to read that so the song out loud to make someone fall asleep. Still reading, she frowns and says, until you deal with your real personal issues, you'll never be able to control yourself. I ask if her book says all that. Most of it's from Dr. Sarah, she says. And I say, how the culling song does more than put people to sleep. How do you mean, she says. I mean, they die. I say, are you sure you've never seen Helen Boyle with a book called Poems and Rhymes from Around the World? Mona Sabat's open hand drops to the desk and picks up her lunch wrapped in foil. She takes a bite, staring at the clock radio. She says, just now, on the radio, Mona says, did you just do that? I nod. You just forced Dr. Sarah to reincarnate, she says. I ask if she can just call Helen Hoover Boyle on her cell phone and maybe I could just talk to her. My pager starts beeping and this Mona person says, so you're saying Helen uses the same calling song. The message on my pager says to call Nash. The pager says it's important. And I say, it's nothing I can prove, but Mrs. Boyle knows how. I say, I need her help so I can control it. So I can control myself. And Mona Savat stops writing on the pad and tears off the page. She holds it halfway between us and says, if you're serious about learning how to control this power, you need to come to a Wiccan practitioner's ritual. She shakes the paper at me and says, we have over a thousand years of experience in one room. And she turns the police scanner on. I take the paper. It's an address, date, and time. The police scanner says, unit Bravo 9, Please respond to a code 914 at the Loomis Apartments, Unit 5D. The mystical depth of this knowledge takes a lifetime to learn, she says. She picks up her lunch and peels back the foil. Oh, she says, and bring your favorite meat-free hot dish. And the police scanner says, copy. Chapter 15. Helen Hoover Boyle takes her cell phone out of the green and white purse, hanging from the crook of her elbow. She takes out a business card and looks from the card to the phone as she punches in a number. The little green buttons bright in the dim light, bright green against the pink of her fingernail. The business card has a gold edge. She presses the phone deep into the side of her pink hair into the phone she says yes i'm somewhere in your lovely store and i'm afraid i'll need some help finding my way out she leans into the note card taped to an armoire twice her height into the phone she says i'm facing and she reads an adam style neoclassical armoire with fire gilded bronze arabesque cartridges She looks at me and rolls her eyes. Into the phone, she says, it's marked $17,000. Her feet step out of the green high heels and she stands flat-footed on the concrete floor in sheer white stockings. It's not the white that makes you think of underwear. It's more the white of the skin underneath. The stockings make her toes look webbed. The suit she's wearing, the skirt is fitted to her hips. It's green, but not the green of lime, more the green of a key lime pie. It's not the green of an avocado, but more the green of an avocado bisque topped with a paper thin sliver of lemon.
served ice cold in the yellow service soup plate. It's the green the way a pool table with felt looks under the yellow one ball, not the way it looks under the red three. I asked Helen Hoover Boyle what code 914 is. And she says, a dead body. And I say, I thought so. Into the phone, she says, now, was that a left or right churn at the rosewood hippo white dresser carved with anthonium details and flocked with powdered silk? She puts her hand over the phone and leans closer to me saying, you don't know Mona, she says. I doubt if her little witch party means anything more than a mob of hippies dancing naked around a flat rock. This close, her hair isn't a solid color of pink. Each curl is a lighter pink along the outside edge with peach Lush, rose, almost red as you look deeper inside. Into the phone, she says. And if I pass the Cromwellian satinwood lolling chair with ivory eschatoons, then I've gone too far. Got it. To me, she says. Lord, I wish you'd never told Mona. Mona will tell her boyfriend and now I'll never hear the end of it. The labyrinth of furniture crowds around us, all browns, reds, and black, gilt and mirrors here and there. With one hand, she fingers the diamond solitaire on her other hand. The diamond is chunky and sharp. She twists it around so the diamond rises over the palm and she presses her open palm on the face of the armoire and gouges an arrow pointing left, blazing a trail through history. Into the phone, she says, thank you so much. She flips it shut and snaps it inside her purse. The beads around her neck are some green stone alternating with beads made of gold. Under these are strands of pearls, none of this jewelry I've ever seen before. She steps back into her shoes and says, from now on, I can see my job is going to be keeping you and Mona apart. She fluffs her pink hair over her ear and says, follow me. With her flat open hand, she gouges an arrow across the top of a table. A lemon oak Sheraton gate leg card table with brass filigree railing. It says on the note card, a cripple now. Leading the way, Helen Hoover Boyle says, I wish you'd let this whole issue drop. She says, it really is of no concern of yours. Because I'm just a reporter is what she means. Because I'm a reporter tracking down a story he can't ever risk telling the world. Because at best, this makes me a voyeur, at worst, a vulture. She stops in front of a huge wardrobe with mirrored doors, and from behind her I can see myself reflected just over her shoulder. She snaps open her purse and takes out a small gold tube. That's exactly what I mean, she says. The note card says it's French Egyptian revival with panels of paper mache palmette detailing and festooned with polychromatic strap work. In the mirror, she twists the gold tube into a pink lipstick until a pink lipstick grows out. And behind her, I say, what if I'm not just my job? Maybe. I'm not just some two dimensional predator taking advantage of an interesting situation. For whatever reason, Nash comes to mind. I say, maybe I noticed the book in the first place because I used to have a copy. Maybe I used to have a wife and a daughter. What if I read the damn poem to my family one night with the intention of putting them to sleep? Hypothetically speaking, of course. What if I killed them? I say, is that the kind of credential she's looking for? She stretches her lips up and down and touches the lipstick to the pink lipstick already there. 
I limp a step closer, asking, does that make me wounded enough in her book? Her shoulders squared straight across. She rolls her lips together. They come apart slow, stuck together for the last moment. God forbid anybody should ever suffer more than heaven, Helen Hoover Boyle. And I say, maybe I've lost every bit as much as her. And she twists her lipstick down. She smacks her lipstick in her purse and turns to face me. Standing there, glittering and still, she says, hypothetically speaking. And I pull my face into a smile and say, of course. With her open right hand against the armoire, she gouges an arrow pointing right and she starts walking, but slow, dragging her hand along the wall of cupboards and dressers, everything waxed and polished, ruining everything she touches. Leading me on, she says, do you ever wonder where that poem originated? Africa, I say, staying right behind her. But the book it came from, she says, walking past gun cabinets and press cupboards and farthingale chairs, she says, witches call their collection of spells their book of shadows. Poems and rhymes from around the world was published 20 years ago, I tell her. I did some calling around. The book had a press run of 500 copies. The publisher, Kinderhouse Press, has since gone bankrupt and the press plates and reprint rights belong to someone who bought them from the original author's estate. The author died of no apparent cause about three years ago. If that makes the book public domain, I don't know. I couldn't find out who owns the rights now. And Helen Hoover Boyle stops dragging her diamond midway across the face of a wide beveled mirror and says, I own the rights and I know where you're going with this. I bought the rights three years ago. Book dealers have managed to find about 300 of those original 500 books, and I've burned every one, she says. But that's not what's important. I agree. What's important is finding the last few books and containing this disaster, doing damage control. What's important is learning a way to forget it ourselves. Maybe that's what Mona Sabat and her group can teach us. Please, Helen says. You're not still planning to go to our witch party, she says. What did you find out about the original author of the book? His name was Basil Frankie, and there was nothing original about him. He found out of print public domain stories and combined them to create anthologies, old medieval sonnets, body limericks, nursery rhymes. Some of it he ripped out of old books he found. Some of it he lifted off the internet. He wasn't very choosy. Anything he could get for free, he'd lump into a book. But the source of this particular poem, she says, I don't know, it's probably some old book still packed in a box in the basement of a house somewhere. Not Frankie's house, says Helen Hoover Boyle. I bought the whole estate. The kitchen trash is still under his sink. His underwear is still folded in his dresser drawers everything. It wasn't there. And I have to ask, did she also kill him? Hypothetically speaking, she says, if I had just killed my husband after killing my son, wouldn't I be a little angry that some plagiarizing, lazy, irresponsible, greedy fool had planted the bomb that would destroy everyone I loved? just like she hypothetically killed the Stuarts. She says, my point is that the original Book of Shadows is still out there somewhere. I agree, and we need to find it and destroy it. And Helen Hoover Boyle smiles, smiles her pink smile, she says. You must be kidding, she says. Having the power of life and death isn't enough. You must wonder what other poems are in that book. Hitting me as fast as a hiccup, me resting my weight on my good foot, just staring at her, I say. She says, maybe you can live forever. 
and I say no. And she says, maybe you can make anyone love you. No. And she says, maybe you can trust, maybe you can turn straw into gold. And I say no and turn on my heel. Maybe you could bring out world peace, she says. And I say no and start off between the walls of armoires and bookcases, between the barricades of Kiro cabinets and headboards. I head down another canyon of furniture. Behind me, she calls, maybe you can turn sand into bread. And I keep limping along. And she calls, where are you going? Is that the way out? At an Irish pine vitrine, vitrine with a broken pendant, type in him, I turn right. At a Chippendale bureau cabinet, japanned in black lacquer, I turn left. Her voice behind everything says, maybe you could cure the sick. Maybe you could heal the cripple. At a Belgian sideboard with a cornish of egg and dart molding, I might turn, I turn right and then left at an Edwardian standing specimen case with a bohemian art glass mural. And the voice coming after me says, maybe you can clean the environment and turn the world into a paradise. At an arrow gouged into a pie crust, occasional table points one way, so I go the other. And the voice says, maybe you could generate unlimited clean energy. Maybe you could travel through time to prevent tragedy, to learn, to meet people. Maybe you could give people rich, full, happy lives. Maybe limping around a noisy ap apartment for the rest of your life isn't enough. On a folding screen of black work embroidery, an arrow points one way, I turn the other. My pager goes off again and it's Nash. And the voice says, if you can kill someone, Maybe you can bring them back. Maybe this is my second chance. The voice says, maybe you don't go to hell for the things you do. Maybe you go to hell for the things you don't do. The things you don't finish. My pager goes off again and it says the message is important. And I keep limping along. Chapter 16. Nash isn't standing at the bar. He's sitting alone at the back table in the back. At the, he's sitting alone at the little table in the back in the dark except for the little candle on the table. And I tell him, hey, I got this 10,000 calls on my pager. I ask, what's so important? On the table is a newspaper folded with the headline saying, seven dead in mystery plague. The subhead says, esteemed local editor and public leader believed to be first victim. Whom they mean, I have to read. It's Duncan, and it turns out his first name was Leslie. It's anybody's guess where they got the esteemed part and the leader part. So much for the journalist and the news being mutually exclusive. Nash taps the newspaper with his finger and says, you see this? And I tell him I've been out of the office all afternoon. And damn it, I forgot to file my next installment on crib death. Reading the front page, I see myself quoted. Duncan was more than just my editor, I'm saying. More than just my mentor. Leslie Duncan was like a father to me. Damn Oliphant in his sweaty hands. Hitting me as fast as a chill, chilling me all the way down my back. The culling song spins through my head and the body count grows. Somewhere, Oliphant must be sliding to the floor or toppled out of his chair. All my powder keg rage issues, they strike again. The more people die, the more things stay the same. An empty paper plate sits in front of Nash with just some waxed paper and yellow smears of potato salad on it. And Nash is twisting a paper napkin between his hands, twisting it into a long, thick cord and looking at me across the candle from him. He says, we picked up the guy in your apartment building this afternoon, he says. Between the guy's cats and the cockroaches, there's not much to autopsy. 
the guy we saw fall down in here this morning, the sideburns guy with the cell phone. Nash says the medical examiner stumped. Plus, after that, three people dropped dead between here and the newspaper building. Then they found another one in the newspaper building, he says, died waiting for an elevator. He says, the medical examiner thinks these folks could all be dead of the same cause. They're saying plague, Nash says. But the police are really thinking drugs, he says. Probably succinylcholine, either self-administered or somebody gave them an injection. It's a neuromuscular blocking agent. It relaxes you so much you quit breathing and die of anoxia. The woman, the one behind the barricade at the movie shoot who came running with her arm out to stop me, the one with the walkie-talkie, the details of her were long black hair, a tight t-shirt over her right up tits. She had a decent little pooper and tight jeans. It could be she and Nash took the scenic route back to the hospital. Another conquest. Whatever Nash is so hot to tell me, I don't want to know, he says. But I think the police are wrong. Nash whips the rolled paper napkin through the candle flame, and the flame jumps, stuttering up a curl of black smoke. The flame goes back to normal, and Nash says, in case you want to take care of me the same as you took care of those other people, he says. You have to know I wrote a letter explaining all this, and I left it with a friend, saying I know it at this point. And I smile and ask what he means. What does he know? And Nash holds the tip of his twisted paper a little over the candle flame and says, I know you thought your neighbor was dead. I know I saw a guy drop dead in this bar with you looking at him, and four more died when you walked past them on your way back to work. The tip of the paper's getting brown, and Nash says, Granted, it's not much, but it's more than the police have right now. The tip puffs into flame, just a tiny flame, and Nash says, Maybe you can fill the police in on the rest of it. The flame's getting bigger. There's people enough here that somebody's going to notice. Nash sitting here setting fires in the bar. People are going to call the police. And I say he's deluded. The little torch is getting bigger. The bartender looks over at us and Nash's little fuse burning shorter and, shor and shorter. Nash just watches the fire in his hand growing out of control. The heat of it on my lips, the smoke in my eyes. The bartender yells, hey, quit screwing around. And Nash moves the burning napkin toward the wax paper and paper plate on the table. And I grab his wrist, his uniform cuff smeared yellow with mustard and his skin underneath loose and soft. And I tell him, okay, I say, just stop, okay? I say, he has to promise never to tell. And with the fuse still burning between us, Nash says, Sure, he says, I promise. Chapter 17. Helen walks up with a wine glass in her hand, just a glimpse of red in the bottom, the glass almost empty. And Mona says, where'd you get that? My drink? Helen says. She's wearing a thick coat made of some fur and different shades of brown with white on each tip. It's open in the front with a powder blue suit underneath. She sips the last of the wine and says, I got it off the bar over there next to the bowl of oranges and that little brass statue. And Mona digs both hands into her own red and black dreadlocks and squeezes the top of her head. She says, that's the altar. She points to the empty glass and says, you just drank my sacrifice to the goddess. Helen presses the empty glass in Demona's hand and says, well, how about you get the goddess another sacrifice, but make it a double this time? We're in Mona's apartment. 
where all the furniture is pushed out into a little patio behind sliding glass doors and covered with a blue plastic tarp. All that's left is the empty living room with a little room branching off one side to where the dinette set should be. The walls and shag carpet are beige. The bowl of oranges and the brass statue of somebody Hindu dancing. They're on the fireplace mantle with yellow daisies and pink carnations scattered around them. The light switches are taped over with masking tape so you can't use them. Instead, Mona's got some flat rocks on the floor with candles set on them. Purple and white candles, some lit, some not. In the fireplace, instead of a fire, more candles are burning. Strands of white smoke drift up from the little cones of brown incense set on the flat rocks with the candles. The only real light is when Mona opens the refrigerator or the microwave oven. Through the walls come horses screaming in cannon fire. Either a brave, stubborn Southern Belle is trying to keep the Union Army from burning the apartment next door, or somebody's television is too loud. Down through the ceiling comes a fire siren and people screaming that we're supposed to ignore. Then gunshots and tires squealing, sounds we have to pretend are okay. They don't mean anything, it's just television. An explosion vibrates down from the upstairs. A woman begs someone not to rape her. It's not real, it's just a movie. We're the culture that cried wolf. These dramaholics, these peaceophobics. With her black fingernails, Mona takes the empty wine glass, the lips smeared with Helen's pink lipstick, and she walks away barefoot, wearing a white terry cloth bathrobe into the kitchen. The doorbell rings. Mona crosses back through the living room, putting another glass of red wine on the mantle. She says, do not embarrass me in front of my coven. And she opens the door. On the doorstep is a short woman wearing glasses with thick frames of black plastic. The woman wearing oven mitts. The woman's wearing oven mitts and holding a covered casserole dish in front of her. I brought a deli takeout box of three bean salad. Helen brought pasta from Chez Chef. The glasses woman scrapes her clogs on the doormat. She looks at Helen and me and says, Mulberry, you have guests. And Mona conks herself in the temple with the heel of her hand and says, That's me. She means, that's my wicked name. I mean, Mulberry, she says. Sparrow, this is Mr. Strenator. And Sparrow nods. And Mona says, and this is my boss. Chinchilla, Helen says. The microwave oven starts beeping and Mona leads Sparrow into the kitchen. Helen goes to the mantle and takes a drink from the glass of wine. The doorbell rings and Mona calls from the kitchen for us to answer it. This time it's a kid with long blonde hair and a red goatee wearing gray sweatpants and a sweatshirt. He's carrying a crock pot with a brown glass lid. Something sticky and brown has boiled up around the lip and the underside of the glass lid is fogged with condensation. He steps inside the door and hands the crock pot to me. He kicks off tennis shoes and pulls his sweatshirt off over his head, his hair flying everywhere. He lays the shirt on top of the crock pot in my hands and lifts his leg to pull first one leg, then the other leg out of his sweatpants. He puts the pants in my arms and he's standing there, hands on his hips, dick and balls naked. Helen pulls the front of her coat shut and throws back the last of the wine. The crock pot is heavy and hot with the smell of brown sugar and either tofu or the dirty gravy sweatpants, the dirty gray sweatpants. And Mona says, oyster, and she's standing beside us. She takes the clothes and the crock pot from me saying, oyster, this is Mr. Strenner, she says, everybody, this is my boyfriend, oyster. And the kid shakes the hair off his eyes and looks at me. He says, 
Mulberry thinks you have a culling poem. His dick tapers to a dribbling pig. Stalacite of wrinkled foreskin. A silver ring pierces the tip. And Helen gives me a look, smiling, but with her teeth clenched. This kid, Oyster, grabs the terry cloth lapels of Mona's bathrobe and says, Geez, you have a lot of clothes on. He leans into her and kisses her over the crock pot. We do ritual nudity, Mona says, looking at the floor. She blushes and motions with the crock pot, saying, Oyster, this is Mrs. Boyle, who I work for. The details about Oyster are his hair. It looks shattered, the way a pine tree looks struck by lightning, splintered, blonde, and standing up in every direction. He's got one of those young bodies. The arms and legs look segmented, big with muscles, then narrow at the joints, the knees and elbows and waist. Helen holds out her hand and Oyster takes it, saying, A peridot ring. Standing there naked and young, he lifts Helen's hand all the way to his face. Standing there all tan and muscled, he looks from her ring down the length of her arm to her eyes and says, A stone this passionate would overpower most people. And he kisses it. We do ritual nudity, Mona says, but you don't have to. I mean, you really don't have to. She nods toward the kitchen and says, Oyster, come help me for a little. And going, Oyster looks at me and says, clothing is dishonesty in its purest form. He smiles with just half his mouth, winks and says, nice tie, dad. And I'm counting one, counting two, counting three. After Mona's gone into the kitchen, Helen turns to me and says, I can't believe you told another person. She means Nash. It wasn't as if I had a choice. Besides, no copies of the poem are available. I told him I burned mine, and I've burned every copy I found in print. He doesn't know about Helen Hoover Boyle or Mona Sabat. There's no way he can use the information. Okay. So there are still a few dozen copies in public libraries. Maybe we can track them down and eliminate page 27 while we hunt for the original source material. The Book of Shadows, Helen says. The grimoire, as witches call it. The Book of Spells. All the power in the world. The doorbell rings and the next man drops his baggy shorts and peels off his t-shirt and tells us his name is Hedgehog. The details about Hedgehog include the empty skin shaking on his arms and chest and ass. His curly black pubic hair matches the couple of hairs stuck to, the, to my palm after we shake hands. <laughs> Hel Helen <laughs> Helen's hands draw up inside the cuffs of her coat sleeves and she goes to the mantle, takes the orange from the altar and starts to peel it. A man named Badger with a real parrot on one shoulder arrives. A woman named Clematis arrives. A Lobila arrives. A bluebird rings the doorbell. Then a possum. Then someone named Lentils arrives. Or someone brings Lentils. It's not clear which. Helen drinks another sacrifice. Mona comes out of the kitchen with oyster, but without her bathrobe. What's left is a pile of dirty clothes inside the front door, and Helen and I are the only ones still dressed. Deep in the pile, a phone rings, and Sparrow digs it out, wearing just her black frame glasses, her breasts hanging as she leans over the pile. Sparrow answers the phone. Dormer dingus and digs, attorneys at law, she says. Describe the rash, please. It takes a minute to recognize Mona from just her head and the pile of chains around her neck. You don't want to get caught looking anywhere else, but her pubic hair is shaved. From straight on, her thighs are two perfect parentheses with her shaved V between them. From the side, her breasts seem to reach out trying to touch people with her pink nipples. 
From behind the small of our back splits into two solid buttocks. And I'm counting four, five, counting six. Oysters carrying a white deli takeout carton. A woman named Honeysuckle is just a calico head wrap. In just a calico head wrap talks about her past lives. And Helen says, doesn't reincarnation strike you as just another form of procrastination? I ask, when do we eat? And Mona says, geez, you sound just like my father. I ask Helen how she keeps from killing everybody here. And she takes another glass of wine off the mantle saying, anybody in this room, and it would be a mercy killing. She drinks half and gives the rest to me. The incense smells like jasmine and everything in the room smells like the incense. Oyster steps to the center of the room and holds the deli carton over his head and says, okay, who brought this abortion? It's my three bean salad. And Mona says, please Oyster, don't. And holding the deli carton by its little wire handle, the handle pinched between just two fingers, Oyster says, meat free means no meat. Now fess up. Who brought this? The hair, the hair under his raised arm is bright orange. So is his other body hair down below. I say, it's just bean salad. With, Oyster says and jiggles the carton with nothing. The room's so quiet you can hear the Battle of Gettysburg next door. You can hear the folk song, the folk, the folk song guitar of somebody depressed in the apartment upstairs. An actor screams and a lion roars and bombs whistle down from the sky. With Worcestershire sauce in the dressing, Oyster says, that means anchovies, that means meat, that means cruelty and death. He holds the carton in one hand and points at it with his other saying, this is going down the toilet where it belongs. And I'm counting seven, counting eight. Sparrow is giving everyone small round stones out of the basket she carries in one hand. She gives one to me. It's gray and cold and she says, hold on to this and tune to the vibration of its energy. This will put us all on the same vibration for the ritual. You hear the toilet flush. The parrot on Badger's shoulder keeps twisting its head around and yanking out green feathers from its beak. Then the bird tilts its head back and gulps each feather in jerking whiplash bites. Where the feathers are gone, plucked, the skin looks dimpled and raw. The man, Badger, has a folded towel thrown over his shoulder for the parrot to grip, and the towel is spotted down, with back, down the back with yellow bird shit. The bird yanks another feather and eats it. Sparrow gives a stone to Helen and she snaps it into her powder blue handbag. I take the wine glass from her and sip it. In the newspaper today, it says how the man at the elevator, the man I wished to death, had had three children, all under six years old. The cop I killed was supporting his elderly grandparent, his elderly parents so they wouldn't be placed in a nursing home. He and his wife were foster parents. He coached Little League and soccer. The woman with the walkie-talkie, she was two weeks pregnant. I drink more of the wine. It tastes like pink lipstick. In the newspaper today is an ad that says, Attention owners of Dorset Fine China, the ad copy says. If you feel nauseated or lose bowel control after eating, please call the following number. To me, Oyster says, Mulberry thinks you killed Dr. Sarah, but I don't think you know jack shit. Mona reaches up to put another sacrifice on the mantle and Helen lifts the glass out of her fingers. To me, Oyster says, the only power of life and death you have is every time you order a hamburger at McDonald's. His face stuck in my face, he says. You just pay your filthy money and somewhere else the axe falls. And I'm counting nine, counting ten. 
Sparrow shows me a thick manual open in her hands. Inside are pictures of wands and iron pots. There are pictures of bells and crystal and quartz crystals. Different colors and sizes of everything. There are black handled knives called Athene. I think. Called Athene. Sparrow says this is so right. Sparrow says that so it rhymes with whammy. Okay, a thammy. That's what it is. Sorry, guys. Okay, let me read that again. There are black handled knives called a thammy. Sparrow says this so it rhymes with whammy. She shows me photos of herbs bundled so you can use them to sprinkle purification water. She shows me amulets polished to deflect negative energy. A white handled ritual knife is called a bull, bull line. Her breasts rest on the open catalog, covering half of each page. Standing next to me, the muscles jumping in his neck, making fists with both hands, Oyster says, Do you know why most survivors of the Holocaust are vegan? It's because they know what it's like to be treated like an animal. The body heat coming off him, he says. In egg production, did you know all the male chicks are ground up alive and spread as fertilizer? Sparrow flips through her catalog and points at something, saying, If you check around, you'll find we offer the best deals for ritual tools in the medium price range. The next sacrifice to the goddess I drink. The one after that, Helen Downs. Oyster circles the room. He comes back to say, Did you know that most pigs don't bleed to death in the few seconds before they're drowned in scalding 140 degree water? The sacrifice after that, I get. The wine tastes like jasmine incense. The wine tastes like animal blood. Helen takes the empty wine glass into the kitchen and there's a flash of real light as she opens the refrigerator and takes out a jug of red wine. An oyster sticks his chin over my shoulder from behind and says, most cows don't die right away, he says. They put a snare around the cow's neck and drag it screaming through the slaughterhouse, cutting off, cutting off the front and back legs while it's still alive. Behind him is a naked girl named Starfish who flips open a cell phone and says, Duly Donner and Dunn, attorneys at law, she says. Tell me, what color is your fungus? Badger comes out of the bathroom, ducking to get his parrot through the doorway. A shred of paper stuck in his butt crack. Naked, his skin looks dimpled and raw, plucked. If the bird sits on his shoulder while he sits on the toilet, I don't want to know. And across the room is Mona, Mulberry. She's laughing with honeysuckle. She's pinned her red and black dreadlocks up into a pile with just her little face sticking out the bottom. On her fingers are rings with heavy red glass jewels. Around her neck, the carpet of silver chains comes down to a pile of amulets and pendants and charms on her breast. Costume jewelry, a little girl playing dress up, barefoot. She's the age my daughter would be if I still had a daughter. Helen stumbles back into the room. She pinches her tongue between two fingers and then goes around the room using the two wet fingers to pinch out the, the cones of incense. She leans back against the fireplace mantle and lifts the glass of wine to her pink mouth. Over the glass, she watches the room. She watches Oyster circling me. He's the age of her son, Patrick, would be. Helen's the age my wife would be if I had a wife. Oyster's the son she would have if she had a son. Hypothetically speaking, of course. This might be the life I had if I had a life. My wife distant and drunk. My daughter exploring some crackpot cult. Embarrassing, embarrassed by us, her parents. Her boyfriend would be this hippie asshole trying to pick a fight with me, her dad. And maybe you can go back in time. Maybe you can raise the dead, all the dead, past and present. 
maybe this is my second chance. This is exactly the way my life might have turned out. Helen in her chinchilla coat is watching the parrot eat itself. She's watching Oyster. And Mona shouting, everybody, everybody, she's saying, it's time to start the invocation. So if we could just create the sacred space, we can get started. Next door, the Civil War veterans are limping home to sad music and reconstruction. With Oyster circling me, the rock in my fist is warm by now. And I'm counting 11, counting 12. Mona Sabat has got to come with us. Someone without blood on her hands. Mona and Helen and me and Oyster, the four of us will hit the road together. Just another dysfunctional family, a family vacation. The quest for an unholy grail. With a hundred paper tigers to slay along the way, a hundred libraries to plunder, books to disarm, a whole world to save from culling. Lobila says to Grenadine, did you read about those dead people in the paper? They say it's like Legionnaire's disease, but it looks like black magic if you ask me. And with her arms spread, the plain brown hair under her arm showing. Mona is herding people into the center of the room. Sparrow points at something in her catalog and says, this is the minimum you'll need to get started. Oyster shakes the hair off his eyes and sticks his chin at me. He comes around to poke his index finger into my chest, poking it there hard, pinned in the middle of my blue tie and says, Listen, Dad, poking me, he says, the only culling song you know is make mine medium well done. And I stop counting. Fast as a muscle twitch, muscling oyster back, I shove hard and slap the kid away, my, ha my hands loud against the kid's bare skin, everybody quiet and watching, and the culling song echoes through my head, and I've killed again. Mona's boyfriend, Helen's son. Oyster stands there another moment looking at me, the hair hanging over his eyes, and the parrot falls off Badger's shoulder. Oyster puts his hands up, finger spread, and says, chill out, dad, and goes with Sparrow and everybody to look at the parrot dead at Badger's feet dead and plucked half naked. And Badger prods the bird with his sandal and says, plucky? I look at Helen my wife, in this new creepy way till death do us part. And maybe if you can kill someone, maybe you can bring them back. And Helen's already looking at me, this smeared black glass in her hand. She shakes her face at me and says, I didn't do it. She holds up three fingers, her thumb and pinky touching in front and says, which is honor, I swear. Chapter 18. Here and now, me writing this, I'm near Biggs Junction, Oregon, parked alongside Interstate 84. The Sarge and me have an old fur coat heaped on the shoulder of the road next to our car. The fur coat splattered with ketchup, circled by flies. It's our bait. This week, there's another miracle in the tabloids. It's something folks call the roadkill Jesus Christ. The tabloids call him the I-84 Messiah. Some guy who stops along the highway, whether there's a dead animal, he lays his hands on it and amen. The ragged cat or crushed dog, even a deer folded in half by a tractor trailer. They gasp and sniff the air. They stand on their broken legs and blink their bird pecked eyes. Folks have this on video. They have snapshots posted on the internet. The cat or porcupine or coyote, it'll stand there another minute. The roadkill Christ cradling its head in his arms, whispering to it. Two minutes after it was shredded fur and bones, a meal for magpies and crows, the deer or dog or raccoon will run away complete, restored, perfect. 
the Sarge and me, a ways down the highway from us, an old man pulls his pickup truck off the road. He gets out of the cab and lifts a plaid blanket out of the bed of the truck. He squats to lay the blanket on the side of the road, traffic blasting past him in the hot morning air. The old man picks at the edges of the plaid blanket to uncover a dead dog, a wrinkled heap of brown fur, not too much different than my heap of fur coat. The Sarge snaps the clip out of his pistol and it's full of bullets. He snaps the clip back home. The old man leans down, both his hands flat open on the hot asphalt, cars and trucks blasting past in both directions and he rubs his cheek against the pile of brown fur. He stands and looks up and down the highway. He gets back into the cab of his pickup and lights a cigarette. He waits. The Sarge and I, we wait. Here we are a week late, always one step behind after the fact. At the first sighting of the roadkill Christ, it was a crew of state workers shoveling up a dead dog a few miles from here. Before they could get it bagged, a rental car pulled over on the highway shoulder behind them. It was a man and a woman, the man driving. The woman stayed in the car and the man jumped out and ran to the road crew. He shouted for them to wait. He said he could help. The dog was just maggots and bones inside a scrap of fur. The man was young, blonde, with his long blonde hair whipping in the wind from cars blasting past them. He had a red goatee and scars cut sideways across both cheeks, just under his eye. The scars were dark red, and the young man reached into the garbage bag with the dead dog and told the crew it wasn't dead. And the road crew laughed. They threw their shovels into their truck, and something inside the garbage bag whimpered. It barked. Now, here and now, while I write this, while the old man waits down the road from us smoking, the traffic blasting past. On the other side of Interstate 84, a family in a station wagon opens a quilt on the gravel shoulder of the road and inside is a dead orange cat. A ways from them, a woman and a child sit in lawn chairs next to a hamster on a paper towel. A ways from them, an older couple stands holding an umbrella to shade a young woman, the young woman bony and twisted sideways in a wheelchair. The old man, the mother and the child, the family, and the older couple, their eyes scan every car as it goes past. The roadkill Christ appears in a different car every time. A two-door or a four-door or a pickup, sometimes on a motorcycle, once in a motorhome. In the snapshots people take, in the videos, it's always the flying blonde hair, the red goatee, the scars. It's always the same man. The outline of a woman waits in the distance in the car, truck, whatever. While I'm writing this, the Sarge sights down the barrel of his pistol at our pile of fur coat. The ketchup and flies, our bait. And like everyone else here, we're waiting for a miracle, for a messiah. Chapter 19. Everywhere outside the car, it was yellow. Yellow to the horizon. Not a lemon yellow, more a tennis ball yellow. It was the way a ball looks on a bright green tennis court. The world on both sides of the highway, all this one color, yellow. Billowing, foaming, big waves of yellow move in the hot wind from the cars going past spreading from the highway's gravel shoulder to the yellow hills, yellow, throwing yellow light onto our car, Helen, Mona, Oyster, me, all of us, our skin and eyes, the details of the whole world, yellow. Brassica tornaforti, Oyster says, Moroccan mustard in full bloom. We're in the leather smell of Helen's big reel at her car with her driving. Helen and I sit up front, Oyster and Mona in the back. 
on the seat between Helen and me is her daily planner book, the red leather binding sticking to the brown leather seat. There's an atlas of the United States. There's a computer printout of cities with libraries that have poem that have the poems book. There's Helen's little blue purse looking green in the yellow light. What I'd give to be a Native American, Mona says, and leans her forehead against the window, to just be free Blackfoot, to just be a free Blackfoot or Sioux 200 years ago, you know, just living in harmony with all that natural beauty. To see what Mona's feeling, I put my forehead against my window, against the air conditioning and the glass is blazing hot. Creepy coincidences, but the atlas shows the entire state of California colored this same bright yellow. An oyster blows out his nose, one quick snort that rocks his head back. He shakes his face at Mona and says, no Indian ever lived with that. The cowboys didn't have tumbleweeds, he says. It wasn't until the late 19th century that tumbleweeds seeds. Russian thistles came over from Eurasia in the wool of sheep. Moroccan mustard came over in the dirt that sailing ships used for, ball, for ballast. The silver trees out there, those are Russian olives. The hundreds of white fuzzy rabbit ears glowing along the highway shoulder are woolly mullions. The twisted dark trees we just passed, black locusts. The dark green brush, the dark green brush flowering bright yellow, it's scotch bloom. They're all part of the biological pandemic, he says. Those old Hollywood Westerns, Oyster says, looking out the window at Nevada next to the highway, he says, with the tumbleweeds and cheat grass and shit, he shakes his head and says, none of this is native, but it's all we have left, he says. Almost nothing in nature is natural anymore. Oyster kicks the back of the front seat and says, hey dad, what's the big daily newspaper in Nevada? Reno or Vegas, I say. And looking out the window, the reflected light making his eyes yellow, Oyster says, both, Carson City too, most of them. And I tell him. The forests along the West Coast are choked with Scotch broom and French broom and, Eng and English ivy and Himalayan blackberries, he says. The native trees are dying from the gypsy moths imported in 1860 by Leopold Trivolt, who wanted to breed them for silk. The deserts and prairies are choked with mustard and cheatgrass and European beach grass. Oyster fingers open the buttons on his shirt and inside, against the skin of his chest, is a beaded something. It's the size of a wallet hanging around his neck from a beaded string. Hopi medicine bag, he says. Pretty spiritual, huh? Helen, looking at him in the rearview mirror, her hands on the steering wheel in the skin-tight calfskin driving gloves, she says, nice abs. Oyster shrugs his shirt off his shoulders, and the beaded bag hangs between his nipples, his chest pumped up on each side of it. The skin's tanned and hairless down to his navel. The back's covered solid with blue beads except for a cross of red beads in the center. His tan looks orange in the yellow light. His blonde hair looks on fire. I made it, Mona says. It took me since last February. Mona with her dreadlocks and crystal necklaces. I ask if she's a Hopi Indian with, her, with his fingers, oyster fishes around inside the bag. And Helen says, Mona, you're not a native anything. Your real last name is Steiner. You don't have to be Hopi, Mona says. I made it from a pattern in a book. Then it's not really a Hopi anything, Helen says. And Mona says, it is. It just looks like the one in the book. She says, I'll show you. From out of his little beaded bag, Oyster takes a cell phone. The fun part about primitive crafts is they're so easy to make while you watch TV, Mona says, and they put you in touch with all sorts of ancient energies and stuff. 
Oyster flips the phone open, pulls out the antenna. He punches in a number. A curve of dirt shows under his fingernail. Helen watches him in the rear view mirror. Mona leans forward over her knees and drags a canvas knapsack off the floor of the back seat. She takes out a tangle of cords and feathers. They look like chicken feathers, dyed bright Easter shades of pink and blue. Brass coins and beads made of black glass hang on cords. This is a Navajo dream catcher I'm making, she says, and shakes it. And some of the cords come untangled and hang loose. Some beads fall into the knapsack in her lap. Pink feathers float loose in the air and she says, I thought to make it more powerful by using some I Ching coins to sort of super, super re-energize it. Somewhere under the knapsack in her lap, the shaved V between her thighs. The glass beads roll there. Into the phone, Oyster says, yeah, I need the number for the retail display advertising department at the Carson City Telegraph Star. A pink feather drifts near his face and he blows it away. With her black painted fingernails, Mona picks at some of the knots, saying, It's harder than the book makes it look. Oyster's one hand holds the phone to his ear. His other hand rubs the beaded bag around his chest. Mona pull, pulls a book out of her canvas knapsack and passes it to me on the front seat. Oyster sees Helen still watching him in the rear view and he winks at her and tweaks his nipple. For whatever reason, Oedipix Rex comes to mind. Somewhere below his belt, the pointed pink stacko light of his foreskin pierced with his little steel ring. How could Helen want that? Old time ranchers planted cheatgrass because it would green up fast in the spring and provide early forage for grazing cattle, Oyster says, nodding his head at the world outside. This first patch of cheatgrass was in the southern British Columbia, was in southern British Columbia, Canada in 1889, but fire spreads it. Every year it dries to gunpowder and now land that used to burn every 10 years, it burns every year. And the cheatgrass recovers fast. Cheatgrass loves fire, but the native plants, the sagebrush and desert phylox, they don't. And every year it burns, there's more cheatgrass and less anything else. And the deer and antelope that depend on those other plants are gone now. So are the rabbits. So are the hawks and owls that ate the rabbits. The mice starve. So the snakes that ate the mice starve. Today, cheatgrass dominates the inland deserts from Canada to Nevada, covering an area over twice the size of the state of Nebraska and spreading by thousands of acres per year. The big irony is even cattle hate cheatgrass, Oyster says. So the cows, they eat the rare native bunch grasses, what's left of them. Mona's book is called Traditional Tribal Hobby Crafts. When I open it, more pink and blue feathers drift out. Now my new life's dream is I want to find a really straight tree, you know, Mona says, a pink feather caught in her dreadlocks, and make a totem pole or something. When you think about it, from a native plant perspective, Oyster says, Johnny Appleseed was a fucking biological terrorist. Johnny Appleseed, he says, might as well be handing out smallpox. Oyster's punching another number on his cell phone. He kicks the back of the front seat and says, Mom, Dad, what's a really posh restaurant in Nevada, in Reno, Nevada? And Helen shrugs and looks at me and she says, The Desert Sky Supper Club in Tahoe is very nice. Into his cell phone, Oyster says, I'd like to place the three column ad display. Looking out the window, he says, it should be three columns by six inches deep and the top line of the copy should read, attention, Patreons of the Desert Sky Supper Club, Oyster says. The second line should say, have you recently contracted a near fatal case of camper, campylobacter 
Lobacter food poisoning? If so, please call the following number to be part of a class action lawsuit. Then Oyster gives a phone number. He fishes a credit card out of his medicine bag and reads the number and expiration date into the phone. He says for the account rep to call him after it's typeset and check the final ad copy over the phone. He says for the ad to run every day for the next week in the restaurant section. He flips the phone shut and presses the antenna back inside. The way yellow fever and smallpox killed off your Native Americans, he says. We brought Dutch elm disease to America in a shipment of logs for a veneer mill in 1930 and brought chestnut blight in 1904. Another path of pathogenical fungus is killing off the eastern beaches. The Asian longhorn beetle introduced to New York in 1996 is expected to wipe out North American maples. To control prairie dog populations, Oyster says, ranchers introduced bubonic plague to the prairie dog colonies, and by 1930, about 98% of the dogs were dead. The plague had spread to kill another 34 species of native rodents, and every year, a few unlucky people die. For whatever reason, the culling song comes to mind. Me, Mona says as I pass her back the book. I like the ancient traditions. My hope is this trip will be, you know, like my own personal vision quest, and I'll come up with an Indian name and be, she says, transformed. Out of his Hopi bag, Oyster takes a cigarette and says, you mind? And I tell him, yes. And Helen says, not at all. And it's her car. And I'm counting one, counting two, counting three. What we think of as nature, Oyster says, everything's just more of us killing the world. Every dandelion's a ticking atom bomb. Biological pollution, pretty yellow devastation. The way you can go to Paris or Beijing, Oyster says, and everywhere there's a McDonald's hamburger. This is the ecological equivalent of a franchise life forms. Every place is the same place. Kutsu, zebra mussels, water hyacinths, starlings, burger kings, the local natives, anything unique gets squeezed out. The only biodiversity we're going to have left, he says, is Coke versus Pepsi. He says, we're landscaping the whole world one stupid mistake at a time. Just staring out his window, Oyster takes a plastic cigarette lighter out of the beaded medicine bag. He shakes the lighter, smacking against the palm of one hand. A pink feather from the book. I sniff it and imagine Mo Mona's hair has the same smell. Twirling the feather between two fingers, I ask Oyster on the phone just now. His call to the newspaper. What's he up to? Oyster lights his cigarette. He tucks the plastic lighter and the cell phone back in his medicine bag. It's how he makes money, Mona says. She's picking apart the tangles and knots in her dream catcher. Between her arms inside her orange blouse, her breasts reach out with their little pink nipples. And I'm counting four, counting five, counting six. Both his hands buttoning his shirt, his mouth pinched around the cigarette and his eyes squinting against the smoke. Oyster says, remember Johnny Appleseed? Helen turns up the air conditioning, and buttoning his collar, Oyster says, don't worry, Dad, this is just me planting my seeds. Looking out at all the yellow, with his yellow eyes, he says, it's just my generation trying to destroy the existing culture by spreading our own contagion. Chapter 20. How are you guys doing? The woman opens the front door and here are Helen and I on her front porch, me carrying Helen's cosmetic case, 
Standing a half step behind her as Helen points the long pink nail of her index finger and says, if you can give me 15 minutes, I can give you a whole new you. Helen's suit is red, but not a strawberry red. It's more the red of a strawberry mousse topped with whim creme fraiche and served in the stemmed crystal compote. Inside her pink cloud of hair, her earrings sparkle pink and red in the sunlight. The woman's drying her hands on a kitchen towel. She's wearing men's brown moccasins with no socks. A big, a bib apron patterned with little yellow chickens covers her whole front and some kind of machine washable dress underneath. With the back of one hand, she pushes some hair off her forehead. The yellow chickens are all holding kitchen tools, ladles and spoons in their beaks, looking at us through the rusted screen door, the woman says, yes? Helen looks back at me standing behind her. She looks back over her shoulder at Mona and Oyster ducked down, hiding in the car parked on the curb. Oyster whispering into his phone, is the itching constant or intermittent? Helen Hoover Boyle brings her fingertips of one hand together at her chest, the mess of pink gems and pearls hiding her silk blouse underneath. She says, Mrs. Pellison, we're here for Miracle Makeover. As she talks, Helen throws her closed hand open toward the woman as if she's scattering the words. Helen says, my name is Mrs. Brenda Williams. With her pink fingertip, she scatters the words back over her shoulder saying, and this is my husband, Robert Williams, she says, and we have a very special gift for you today. The woman inside the screen door looks down at the cosmetic case in my hand and Helen says, may we come in? It was supposed to be easier than this. This whole traveling around, just dropping into libraries, taking a book off the shelf, sitting on a toilet in the library bathroom and cutting out the page, then flush. It was supposed to be that quick. The first couple libraries, no problem. The next, the book isn't on the shelf. In library whispers, Mona and I go to the checkout desk and ask. Helen's waiting in the car with Oyster. The librarian's a guy with his long straight hair pulled back in a ponytail. He's got earrings in both ears, pirate hoop earrings, and he's wearing a plaid sweater vest and says the book is, he scrolls up and down his computer screen. The book is checked out. It's really important, Mona says. I had it before that and I left something in between the pages. Sorry, the guy says. Can you tell us who has it, Mona says. And the guy says, sorry, no can do. And I'm counting one, counting two, counting three. Sure, everybody wants to play God, but for me, it's a full-time job. I'm counting four, counting five. A beat later, Helen Hoover Boyle standing at the checkout desk. She smiles until the librarian looks up from his computer and she spreads her hands her rings bright and crowded on each finger. She smiles and says, young man, my daughter left an old family photograph between the pages of a certain book. She wiggles her fingers and says, can you, you can follow the rules or you can do a good deed, take your pick. The librarian watches her fingers, the prism colors and stars of broken light dancing across his face. He licks his lips, then he shakes his head no and says it's just not worth it. The person with the book will complain and he'll get fired. We promise, Helen says, we won't lose you your job. In the car, I'm waiting with Mona counting. 27, counting 28, counting 29. Trying the only way I know not to kill everybody in the library and look up the address on the computer myself. Helen comes out to the car with a sheet of paper in her hand. She leans in the open driver's side window and says, good news and bad news. Mona and Oyster are lying across the back seat and they sit up. I'm on the shotgun side of the front seat counting. And Mona says, they have three copies, but they're all checked out.
and Helen gets in behind the steering wheel and says, I know a million ways to cold call. And Oyster shakes the hair off his eyes and says, good job, mom. The first house went easy enough, and the second. In the car between house calls, Helen picks through the gold tubes and shiny boxes, her lipstick and makeup, her cosmetic case open in my lap. She twists the pink lipstick up and squints at it, saying, I'm never using any of this again. If I'm not mistaken, that last woman had a ringworm. Mona leans forward from the back seat, looking over Helen's shoulder and says, you're really good at this. Screwing open a little screwing open little round boxes of eyeshadow, looking and sniffing at their tan or pink or peach insides, Helen says, I've had a lot of practice. She looks at herself in the rear view mirror and pulls around a few strands of pink hair. She looks at her watch, pinching the face between the thumb and index finger and says, I shouldn't tell you this, but this was my first real job. By now we're parked outside a rusted trailer. By now we're parked outside a rusted trailer house sitting in a square of dead grass scattered with children's plastic toys. Helen snaps her case shut. She looks at me sitting beside her and says, you ready to try again? Inside the trailer, talking to the women in the apron covered with little chickens, Helen saying, there's absolutely no cost or obligation on your part. And she backs the woman onto the sofa. Sitting across from the woman, the woman sitting so close their knees almost touch, Helen reaches toward her with a soft brush and says, suck in your cheeks, dear. With one hand, she grabs a handful of the woman's hair and pulls it straight up into the air. The woman's hair is blonde with an inch of brown at the roots. With her other hand, Helen runs a comb down the hair in fast strokes, holding the longer strands up and crushing the shoulder br shorter brown ones down against the scalp. She grabs another handful and rats, teases, back combs until all but the longest hairs are crushed and tangled against the scalp. With the comb, she smooths the long blonde strands over the ratted short hairs until the woman's head is a huge fluffed bubble of blonde hair. And I say, so that's how you do that. It's identical to Helen's hairdo, only blonde. On the coffee table in front of the sofa is a big arrangement of roses and lilies, but wilted and brown, the flowers standing in a green vase in a green glass vase from a florist with only a little black water in the bottom. On the dinette table in the kitchen are more flower arrangements, just dead stalks and thick, stinking water. Lined up on the floor against the back wall of the living room are more vases, each holding a block of green foam pin cushioned with curled wasted roses or black spindly carnations growing gray mold. Stuck in each bouquet is a little card saying, in deepest sympathy. And Helen says, now put your hands over your face. And she starts shaking a can of hairspray. She fogs the woman with hairspray. The woman cowers blind, bent forward a little, with both hands pressed over her face. And Helen jerks her head towards the rooms at the other end of the trailer. And I go. Pumping a mascara brush in its tube, she says, you don't mind if my husband uses your bathroom, do you? Helen says, now look up at the ceiling, dear. In the bathroom, there are piles of dirty clothes separated into different colored piles on the floor. Whites, darks, somebody's jeans and shirts stained with oil. There's towels and sheets and bras. There's a red checkered tablecloth. I flush the toilet for the sound effect. There's no diapers or children's clothes. In the living room, the chicken woman is still looking at the ceiling. Only now she's shaking with long, jerking breaths. Her chest under her apron shaking. Helen is touching the corner of a folded tissue to the watery makeup. The tissue is soaked in black mascara and Helen saying, it will be better someday, Rhonda. You can't see that, but it will. Folding another tissue and dabbing, she says, 
what you have to do is make yourself hard. Think of yourself as something hard and sharp. She says, you're still a young woman, Rhonda. You can go back to school and turn this hurt into money. The chicken woman, Rhonda, is still crying with her head tilted back, staring at the ceiling. Behind the bathroom, there's two bedrooms. One has a water bed. In the other bedroom is a crib and hanging mobile plastic daisies. There's a chest of drawers painted white. The crib is empty. The little plastic mattress is tied in a roll at one end. Near the crib is a stack of books on a stool. Poems and rhymes is on top. When I put the book on the dresser, it falls open to page 27. I run the point of my baby pin down the inside edge of the page, tight in next to the binding and the page pulls out. With the page folded in my pocket, I put the book back on the stack. In the living room, the cosmetics are dumped in a heap on the floor. Helen's pulled a false bottom out of the inside of her cosmetic case. Inside are layered necklaces and bracelets, heavy brooches and pairs of earrings clipped together. All of them crusted and dazzling with shattered red and green, yellow and blue lights, jewels. Draped between Helen's hands is a long necklace of yellow and red stones, larger than her polished pink fingernails. In brilliant cut diamonds, she says, look for no light leakage through the facets below the girdle of the stone. She lays the necklace in the woman's hand, saying, in rubies, aluminum oxide, foreign bits inside, called rutile inclusions can give the stone a soft pinkish look unless the jeweler breaks the stone under high heat. The trick to forgetting the big picture is to look at everything close up. The two women sit so close their knees dovetail together. Their heads almost touch. The chicken woman isn't crying. The chicken woman is wearing a jeweler's loop in one eye. The dead flowers are shoved aside and scattered on the coffee table are clusters of sparkling pink and smooth gold, cool white pearls and carved blue lap, lapis luzi, lu, luzus, lu, oh, I can't even. lapis lazulis. Other clusters glow orange and yellow. Other piles shine silver and white and Helen cups a blazing green egg in her hand. So bright, both women look green in the reflected light. And she says, do you see the kind of uniform veil-like inclusions in a synthetic emerald? Her eye clenched around the loop, the woman nods. And Helen says, remember this, I don't want you to get burned the way I was. She reaches into the cosmetic case and lifts out a bright handful of yellow saying, this yellow sapphire brooch was owned by the movie star Natasha Wren. With both hands, she takes out a sparkling pink heart, trailing a long chain of sm smaller diamonds, saying, This 700 carat barrel pendant once was owned by Queen Marie of Romania. In this heap of jewels, Helen Hoover Boyle would say, are the ghosts of everyone who has ever owned them, everyone rich and successful enough to prove it, all of their talent and intelligence and beauty outlived by decorative junk, all the success and accomplishment this jewelry was supposed to represent, it's all vanished. With the same hairdo, the same makeup, leaning together so close they could be sisters, they could be mother and daughter before and after, past and future. There's more, but that's when I go out to the car. Sitting in the back seat, Mona says, you find it? And I say, yeah, not that it does this woman any good. The only thing we've given her is big hair and probably ringworm. Oyster says, show us the song. Let's see what this trip is all about. And I tell him, no fucking way. I tuck the folded page in my mouth and chew and chew. My foot aches and I take off my shoe. I chew and I chew. Mona falls asleep. 
I chew and chew. Oyster looks out the window at some weeds in a ditch. I swallow the page and I fall asleep. Later, sitting in the car, driving to the next town, the next library, maybe the next makeover, I wake up and Helen has been driving for almost 300 miles. It's almost dark. And just looking out the windshield, she says, I'm keeping track of expenses. Mona sits up, scratching her scalp through her hair. She presses the finger next to her pinky finger. She presses the pad of that finger into the inside corner of her eye and pulls it away fast with an eye goober stuck to it. She wipes the goober on her jeans and says, where are we going to eat? I tell Mona to buckle her seatbelt. Helen turns on the headlights. She opens one hand wide against the steering wheel and looks at the back of it, her rings and says, after we find the book of shadows, when we're all, when we're the all powerful leaders of the entire world, after we're immortal and we own everything on the planet and everyone loves us, she says, You'll still owe me for $200 worth of cosmetics. She looks odd. Her hair looks wrong. It's her earrings, the heavy clumps of pink and red, pink sapphires and rubies. They're gone. So we're on chapter 21, you guys. And we're going to stop here. So it seems like we're kind of like reading like the first time. I think we're reading like 10 chapters every two hours. So there'll be definitely a part three, and I'm thinking there might be a part four. <laughs> Do you guys need a stiff drink? I might need a stiff drink after that one. I don't know, Dragonfly, if they do or not. Um, I, I don't know if it's like authentic, but it became legal um, like a few years ago, I want to say. I don't know like how authentic because I've never had like the real, real stuff. So who knows what? Probably could Google it though and find out. Thank you, Steph. Steph, thank you so much for modding for your first time. I'm sure everyone was amazing here because there's such amazing people that join us. Thank you guys so much. So I don't know about tomorrow. I think that um, Zav Girl might be doing a live tomorrow, but I'm not sure. So just look for, if you guys haven't subbed, sub and then you'll get the notification when I do, um, when I upload a thumbnail. I will definitely try to do one, um, if not tomorrow, then maybe Wednesday. How many pages in the whole book? Okay, let me tell you. So right now we're on page 125 and the whole book, good question. The whole book is 260. <laughs> so, I mean, we're like halfway there. So probably I would say like this will be a four-parter. Um, thank you, Club de Medicado. VIP. I think I'm just going to call you Club A when I'm on a mic. I hope you don't mind. Tatum, you did. You can go back and listen. It might be good to like put you to sleep, but I'm not sure. There was like some planes that flew by. I giggled and um, during one part, I couldn't help it. You guys like it. There's certain things that will make me giggle. Thank you, Mesora. I love you guys so much. Thank you guys for being here. Oh, really? English is your second language, Clave? Well, you speak perfectly. Like every time you write, it's perfect English. It's amazing. So I hope that you guys will come back for the third installment. And um, we'll see what happens with tomorrow. If... Um, Tiff's live, I'm obviously going to be over there modding. If not, then I will 
do one so we can try to like put the whole book together and listen to it as one. <laughs> Thank you, Dragonfly. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for being here. Have a good night. Get your stiff drinks. Get everything done. <laughs> Go to bed and be cozy because it seems like it's a cozy night. Monday night's over, everybody. Well, if you're listening to me in another country, I think you might even be ahead of us. So yeah, Monday night's over. Thank you guys so much. Have a good night. Love you all.